So apparently it, everything is okay. So we go with the second speaker of the morning, which is Edward Wilson Ewe. Uh, if I'm not wrong, he's going to talk about the observational traces of loop quantum cosmology and relation with loop quantum gravity. So whenever you want. All right. Thank you very much. So let me start by thanking the organizers for putting this together. Um, I'm happy to give this talk. I was asked to give a bit of a review both on the phenomenology of loop quantum cosmology as well as on group field theory cosmology. So due to time limitations, I'm gonna try and do both, but I'll have to leave some pieces out. Um, so I apologize in advance for going uh, a little bit fast over both of those pieces, but we'll see what we can do. Um, so let me start just by asking what our goal here is in address in applying loop quantum gravity to cosmology. Uh, there are lots of questions in cosmology where quantum gravity may be able to give a bit of an answer. And I think it's important to stress that it may be able to give an answer. So some of these questions, quantum gravity may have something to say, but not necessarily. So for example, question of dark energy, maybe that's related to quantum gravity, but maybe not. So we have to be careful and keep in mind that maybe we won't be able to answer all of these questions. But there are certainly some questions that we should be able to answer. So for example, what happens in the earliest moments of our universe when the energy density and the space-time curvature are very large? So here I've picked four questions and some sub-questions. So let me go through them very quickly. Uh, we can see that the universe is very nearly homogeneous at the largest scales. So why? Where does that come from? What are dark matter and dark energy? What sourced the temperature and isotropies that we see in the CMB? And can we describe the earliest moments of our universe? Now, I chose this order because I think if you ask most cosmologists, they'll start with this question and then move down in terms of the questions that they think about the most or are the most confused about. But in our community, we've really started here and we're starting to work upwards. So I think we should, you know, uh, there are reasons for doing that. But we should also keep in mind that you know, the cosmologists are very, very interested in these questions as well and not neglect them and see if there's something that we can say about them. Okay, now luckily, I'm following Param who gave a very nice talk. And so I'll be very fast on loop quantum cosmology. I'll just essentially give this one slide. So we know that the basic idea is to include effects due to including holonomies and inverse tried corrections in a symmetry reduced setting. And what we find is that we get a bounce. So we have, and, and as Param stressed, this is a fully quantum theory. We can evolve what the wave function looks like as a function of a relational field. And we get this bouncing universe here. Now again, as Param emphasized, LQC is not derived from loop quantum gravity, but rather it's really motivated by it. And so I think one question that's very important is to try and close the gap between full loop quantum gravity and the symmetry reduced loop quantum cosmology. Now there's been a lot of work in this direction and unfortunately I don't have the time to talk about all the different approaches that have been followed. Um, so there has been considerable work both in canonical LQG um, and also relating to the connection to modified LQC that Pram was mentioning. There's been a lot of work in spin foams and also in group field theory. So due to time limitations, I'm really gonna focus on this third point. This is the one that I've personally worked on, but please do keep in mind that there's been a lot of work in the other approaches as well. So in one slide, or even half a slide, what is group field theory? Um, the idea is that you have spin foam model, then you can view the transition amplitudes as coming from the perturbative expansion of a partition function. And that partition function you can think of as coming from a field theory on a group manifold. And so that's what the, your group field theory is. Now, you can view group field theory in a canonical form, and then you have these creation annihilation operators. And these creation operators, so for example, this creation operator here, will create a spin network node and it has some labels, so it has some intertwiner, it has some spins J, and some magnetic numbers M, and possibly uh, some scalar field that lives at the node. Now this just gives you a spin network node on its own, and of course you eventually want to 
connect those together to get a full spin network, and you can get that through entangling these different links through their magnetic numbers. Okay, so this, in a very, very short snapshot, is GFT, and I think we'll hear a little bit more, or a lot more about this uh, tomorrow. But now, let's go to the cosmological setting, and the simplest cosmological spacetimes are obviously the most natural ones to start looking at. And so if we're interested in making contact with homogeneous and isotropic spacetimes, then we want to somehow impose homogeneity on our quantum state. And the simplest way to do that is by requiring that all of the excitations, all of these quantum geometry or all these spin network nodes are in the same state. So this is exactly a condensate. And the simplest constant state we can do is just a coherent state of this type. So the onsatz here is that to get a homogeneous spacetime, we should look at constant states that look like this. Okay, now, once we have a state, of course, we want to look at the dynamics that comes out from it. Now, the philosophy here is that we're interested really in the hydrodynamics of this state. So we're interested in the collective observables, so the observables that are relevant really at large scales. So for example, we'll be interested in calculating what the total volume is of this state as a function of our scalar field, which we'll use as a relational clock in much the same way as is done in loop quantum cosmology. Now it turns out that for a general condensate state, like I showed on the previous slide here, you can look at its dynamics um, in, the in the context where we expect this state to solve the equations of motion. And we find that this volume here bounces and always remains non-zero. So we get an emergent non-singular bouncing cosmology. And if we choose, make some appropriate choices of the parameters in the GFT action, we get a good classical limit. So this is very nice. Uh, what's more, if we consider a condensate that has only single spins that are excited, so that means that if I go back, sorry, if I go back to this condensate state, then this prefactor here is zero, except when, let's say, all of these j's are one half. So we only have a condensate state that excites the cases when all of these J labels are one half. Then we get an equation for V that has this form. The prime here is a derivative with respect to our relational clock. These, of course, are our expectation values here. And we get this equation. Here, E is just a constant of motion that depends on the state that you choose. Now, if you set E is equal to zero, which is perfectly allowed, this is exactly the same equation of motion as the effective uh, Freeman equation in LQC. So we seem to be making contact here between the GFT condensate states and loop quantum cosmology. Um, let me just quickly mention a, I think, interesting point of difference uh, with spin foams. In spin foams, you'll often say that the classical limit is when you take J being very, very large. Here, we seem to make contact with LQC, where instead the number of quanta becomes large. Okay. There's also been a lot of work extending this uh, beyond these simplest models. So I'll, I'll just put up some references here. I'm afraid I don't have time to say much about this, but please do be aware that there's been a lot of work going beyond uh, these models here. Okay. Now, we have these pictures of um, how quantum gravity effects arise in the early universe. And so I want to go back to some of the questions I raised on my first slide and see what we have to say about them. So some of the questions I'd asked are, well, what happens to the Big Bang singularity? How are the dynamics modified? And so what we see is that quantum gravity predicts a non-singular bounce, and these quantum gravity effects become very small, very rapidly, as you move away from the uh, Planck regime. Another question is, how did the universe become classical? Now, this is a question that's been asked many times about perturbations. So we have perturbations that start in some quantum state, they evolve, they appear classical today. Why did that happen? 
So there's been a huge amount of work on this. This is only a few of the papers that have looked at that. But here I want to ask a different question. What about the homogeneous background? The homogeneous background also looks classical, but presumably it was also quantum in the early universe. So how did that happen? And I don't think we have a full answer to this yet, but I just want to point out two results which I think do show us a way of how we could answer this. So we know in loop quantum cosmology that if you have a state that has a large spatial volume, then it's possible for the relative quantum uncertainties to be very small. And furthermore, on top of that, if you look at GFT cosmology, you can calculate what these relative quantum uncertainties are, and you actually see that they decrease as the universe expands. So in some sense, we are getting a sort of classical limit as the universe gets bigger and bigger in this context. Now this, I think, still has to be made more precise, but I think it's very encouraging that we have some pointers uh, towards answering this question in terms of the background as well. Okay. Let me move on to the next topic, which has to do with the CMB. So we have this incredible wealth of data from the relatively early universe. And so it's very natural to ask, well, what can this tell us about quantum gravity? Now, of course, to make contact uh, from loop quantum gravity or loop quantum cosmology with the CMB, we'll need to understand how cosmological perturbations evolve. Now, there have been a number of approaches that have been proposed. And I'll go through these quickly. I'll just give the basic idea behind them. I don't have time to go into the details of how they're uh, defined. So historically, the first one that was developed was the anomaly-free approach. And so the idea here is that you have these classical constraints that have some constraint algebra, and you modify these classical constraints in a way that's motivated by loop quantum cosmology. And you constrain these modifications by requiring that the algebra remain closed. So that's the basic idea here. Uh, another approach is a mixed quantization. So there are two implementations of this that differ in technical ways, but the basic philosophy is the same. And that is that we have a background, so a Friedman background, which is described by loop quantum cosmology, and we'll describe the perturbations using a thought quantization. So here we're really looking we're including quantum gravity corrections in the background, and we're including quantum corrections, uh, or we're giving a quantum description of the perturbations, but we're not necessarily including quantum gravity directly uh, in the perturbations. And finally, there is a separate universe approximation that you can use, and it turns out that with this, you can do a loop quantization, but of long wavelength scalar perturbations only. So it doesn't capture everything that you would like, but it is a true loop quantization. Whereas here you'll have a thought quantization, here you don't have a quantum theory at all. It's really entirely effective. So each of these approaches has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, and depending on the problem that you're looking at, you may want it to tr follow different approaches here. Now, let me just say a few words about the dynamics of perturbations. So if you're interested in scalar perturbations, which are the ones that are most relevant for the temperature and isotropies in the CMB, then the dynamics are essentially captured in terms of this V variable in this equation, which is known as the Mukhanov-Sasaki uh, equation. And the key point is that this is expressed in terms of your Fourier modes. So if you have a large wave number, then this term is going to dominate, and you'll just have oscillations. So your short wavelength modes they don't feel a space-time curvature and they just oscillate. Your long wavelength modes, however, will feel this term, which tells you about the space-time curvature, and they'll respond to what your background space-time is doing. And here Z is this function here. Now, what I want you to notice is that this is a classical equation, of course, and Z has this particular form. But in classical GR, we can rewrite this, right? We have a Friedman equation where H squared is proportional to the energy density. So we could replace h here by the square root of rho, for example. Or we could do other things also, right? We have some classical equations of motion that allow us to rewrite this form. So when we go to LQC, what is the right form for z? Is it this form here, or is it some other rewriting which would be equivalent in the classical theory, but which would be inequivalent for LQC? And it turns out that if you work in the separate universe approach, or in the anomaly-free approach, these are two different 
approaches completely, but they give exactly the same result, and that is that this is the choice that you should make. So th this is some insight that comes from these other approaches that perhaps can be useful for the uh, mixed quantizations where there's really not much insight into which choice of Z that you can make. Of course, different choices can be made and you can explore the phenomenology, but here we have some hints from other approaches that maybe this is a good choice to make. Okay, the other thing I want to discuss is that we have this equation of motion, which is classical. Now, of course, if we go to LQC, perhaps it's modified, much like the Friedman equation is modified in LQC, in the effective framework. So do we expect any modifications? Well, in the anomaly free effective approach, it turns out that the prefactor to k squared changes. And this has been called a signature change in the literature. Now, it turns out that if you choose vacuum initial conditions in the pre-bounce era, then this signature change will cause an exponential uh, growth in your short wavelength modes. And this amplification really rules it out. Now this has, th this being ruled out depends of course on how you set your initial conditions. But if you make these choices which are reasonable, then that particular approach is ruled out. Now I want to stress of course, other choices are viable. So it has been shown how you can choose initial conditions such that we get something that does match what we see in the CMP. Um, in the mixed quantization approaches, you're doing a thought quantization. So by definition, you're essentially assuming that the equation will be the same. And as I mentioned earlier, here in the separate universe approach, you really can derive the equation, but only for long wavelength scalar modes. So you don't know what happens to the k squared term, but then you see that the equation is unchanged. So. Okay, so we have these approaches to perturbation theory, and we'd like to compare that with the CMB. Now, what's often done is to combine loop quantum cosmology with various cosmological paradigms, and in particular, inflation, which is by far the most popular one, for, for good reason, I think. Uh, but I do stress it's not the only one, though. Now, in inflation, what happens is that you have these, your short wavelength modes, which are the only modes that are relevant observationally are initially short wavelength and lie inside the horizon. You assume that they're in their vacuum state, their quantum vacuum state initially, and these will, you have a period of exponential expansion or near exponential expansion. And during this growth, your modes are redshifted. They exit the Hubble radius. And at that point, they feel the space-time curvature once their physical wavelength becomes large enough. And this is a calculation you can calculate that they become nearly scale invariant, which is what's observed in the CMB. Now, we can expect quantum gravity effects to show up in one of two places. Um, so first, if you have modes that were initially super Hubble and felt the space-time curvature at the bounce, then these could be modified. Now, this requires you know, a, a small amount or a comparatively small amount of inflation so that these modes don't get pushed to sub super horizon scales. So if, let's say, you have hundreds of E-folds of inflation, then any modes that were initially super Hubble, they're super horizon, we can't see them anymore. So to see this, you need to have around 60 to 70 E-folds, not more. Now you can also have modifications of the initial vacuum state. And of course, when you define your vacuum state, when you're far away from the uh, Hubble radius, everyone will agree on what the vacuum state is. It's only when you get close to the Hubble radius when your modes start to feel the space-time curvature that you can have some effects. So we'll have some, the vacuum state we expect will be modified by the bounce in some way. Um, and there are different pr proposals for how exactly that will happen. But this modification will really only affect modes that are super horizon or near horizon. So here you can get a little bit further in, but not so much further. So the takeaway from this is that LQC effects can show up in the CMB, but to see them, you really need to have a reasonably small amount of inflation. Otherwise, these effects are pushed to super Hubble scales, and we just can't see them today. Okay, let me say a little bit about alternatives to inflation, because inflation is certainly not the only mechanism that can give you the scale invariance that we see in the CMB. So two alternatives um, that I think are particularly interesting uh, coming from loop quantum cosmology 
are the matter-dominated cosmic bounce and the ekphotic universe. And these are interesting because they both depend on a cosmic bounce to, for them to, to work. You, you, you have a contracting phase, which is where the, the scale and variance is generated, and then you need a bounce, which then leads to our expanding universe today. So it's very natural to try and combine these because LQC gives the bounce that really these scenarios need and often have a hard time getting. Uh, but there's a problem because in both of these scenarios, if you have any background anisotropies at all, um, what those background anisotropies will do is that they'll generate a scale invariant quadruple moment in the perturbations. And so this is an anisotropic feature in the perturbations, so there'll be a preferred direction in the sky. And because this feature is scale invariant, it's very highly constrained. So this leads to a fine tuning problem for both of these scenarios. So this is something that has to be taken into account. If you want these scenarios to work, you really need anisotropies in your background to be very, very small. And just to comment on ekporosis, ekporosis uh, is a model where uh, it's commonly thought, or commonly argued, I should say, that anisotropies become small as you approach the bounce. And this is true in the sense that anisotropies become small compared to the energy density of the background field. But the anisotropies themselves don't become small. It's only in comparison to the background field that they become small. But what's relevant for this quadruple moment is the anisotropies themselves, not in relation to the energy density. So even for ekporosis, this is still a very strong constraint. Okay. So let me return to inflation. The fact that in the CMB, we have some anomalies that occur at large scales, and the fact that LQC, if it leaves any imprints in the CMB, it will be at large scales, this seems very suggestive. So perhaps these anomalies could be explained by quantum gravity. I want to stress that these anomalies have a modest statistical significance. They could be due to cosmic variance, but it's very intriguing, and I think it's certainly worth exploring the possibility that perhaps quantum gravity could say something about this. If quantum gravity could resolve these anomalies, that would be very, very nice. Now, there are two ways, at least in the context of LQC, there are other proposals outside of LQC as well, uh, but within the context of LQC, there are two ways that have been proposed, either in the choice of the initial vacuum state, and there are two concrete proposals that I'm aware of that uh, uh, have done this, and these both predict low powers. This is one of the, um, one of the uh, anomalies. The, the two main anomalies are the low power at large scales and a dipolar or a hemispherical asymmetry. These are the two main ones. Um, and so both of these uh, choices of the initial vacuum state will take care of the low power at large scales, but they won't address the hemispherical anomaly. Uh, there is another way that this could be addressed, and that's look, by looking at non-Gaussian modulation. So what this means is that you have some non-Gaussianities in the early universe, and the uh, superhorizon modes have an impact on subhorizon modes through non-Gaussian correlations. Now, here, if you neglect oscillations in K, so when you have these LQC effects in these superhorizon modes, it leads to large oscillations. So if you neglect the oscillations, then this non-Gaussian modulation can make all of the anomalous features more likely. So not just low power, but all of them. But to do this, you need to neglect oscillations. Now, if you keep on neglecting oscillations in K, it turns out that you have these template matching techniques that can be used, and they very strongly constrain this scenario and essentially rule it out, as far as I understand. But again, this is because you're neglecting the oscillations in K. Now, if you include the oscillations, it turns out that this really suppresses the signature that you look for in the template. So it, it is still viable um, in the sense that this non-Gaussian modulation is not ruled out if you include oscillations, but we don't know if the oscillations are included whether this addresses the anomalies or not. So now we have to return to this question as, okay, if we include oscillations, can we handle the anomalies or not? This we don't know. Uh, Ivan can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and the other thing I want to emphasize is that both, well, all three of these proposals really require having 70 or of the order of 70 inflationary evils. 
If you have more than that, then these features will be pushed to super horizon scales and they won't be able to explain the anomalies that we see. Okay. Um, let me be fast here. Uh, beyond the CMB temperature data, we also see that primordial gravitational waves and non-gauss sanities are constrained to be very small. So here you, you see the uh, two, the, sorry, the three sigma contours here. Here you have phi squared inflation well outside of it. This was sort of the canonical model for inflation not that long ago, and now it's completely ruled out. Of course, other models still remain. Starobinsky inflation lies right in the middle of that, so that's perfectly viable. But the point here is that many of the cosmological models have been ruled out, including some of the most popular ones. Um, and both many inflationary and alternatives are strongly disfavored by the data. So we have these observational constraints, and we also have fine-tuning problems, which I had discussed a little bit earlier. So I, I think this really raises the question, can quantum gravity somehow generate near scale invariance on its own? Do we really have to rely on these other scenarios to get this for us? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have an answer to this, but I, I think this is a very important question, and I encourage people to think about this. Can we somehow generate the scale invariance that we observe in the CMB without uh, introducing some other ingredient? If we can, that would be wonderful. Okay. And just a quick slide to mention that there's also been progress in cosmological perturbation theory working in full LQG, right? Not just in LQC, but in the full theory. Uh, and again, I apologize, I don't have time to explain all the details here, but there's been a lot of work, very interesting, and a lot of this has been and will be presented in parallel sessions. So uh, please take a look at those if you're interested. Okay. Um, let me briefly go over one of the important open questions in my mind, which considers transplankian modes. So if we have a perturbation that has some wavelength lambda, as the universe expands, it's redshifted by the scale factor. So if we have a universe which has expanded a lot, then that means that modes that today are, that are cosmologically relevant initially had a much shorter wavelength. And in particular, if you start off with modes that have a wavelength which is shorter than the Planck length, you'll eventually reach cosmological scales if you have enough expansion. So what is the physics of these transplankian modes? Can we have transplankian modes that coexist with discrete quantum geometry? Or are new modes of the order of the Planck length continuously created, for lack of a better word, as the universe expands? Uh, th these are questions. I think this is an open problem. Um, and I think it's something that is worth thinking about. So I don't have anything here really to offer in terms of an answer, but another question that I think is worth thinking about. Okay, so I'm reaching the end of my talk, and I wanna now move up to the top two questions, which are often among the, you know, as I said, we've worked on them a little bit less, but cosmologists think about them a lot, and so we should put some effort there to see if we can answer them. So, a few thoughts in the dark sector. Um, I, I think a very intriguing question is whether dark matter could be entirely or partially due to black holes of some sort. So there's been a lot of work asking whether primordial black holes or black hole remnants uh, could contribute, in particular some that come from a pre-bounce era. So of course that's very natural within the context of loop quantum gravity. And I, I wanna mention here that recently LIGO has found uh, a black hole, well, black hole candidate, but everyone's pretty sure it's the black hole, in this range of masses where some theorists had made you know, what they thought were some very strong arguments that there really shouldn't be any black holes in that mass range. But that's been seen by LIGO. So, and going back further, the very first merger had a black hole with a much larger mass than was expected to be seen. So we're, now that we can detect black holes, we're detecting black holes everywhere. So I wouldn't be shocked if we have black holes, you know, that Planckian or near Planckian scales as well. That's certainly a possibility that we should consider seriously. Okay. Um, and let me say a little thing about dark energy. Now, I, I think the simplest explanation for dark energy is just the cosmological constant, and this is something that's 
been argued by Eugenio and, and Carlo here. And so that's a, a very possible and very simple explanation. But we also have to keep an eye on observations. So there's been some recent work by the DESI group that suggests that an increasing equation of state for dark energy is preferred. So that, of course, means that it wouldn't be a cosmological constant. And also, the Hubble tension can be alleviated by a cosmological constant that grows in time. So th these are just two data points, but it's just to suggest that observations may be pushing us away from a cosmological constant. It's certainly not ruled out, but keep an eye on what uh, future measurements have to say about this. Okay, and now quickly on the first point that I mentioned, what explains the homogeneity of the early universe that we see? And I think there's, there's a hope that if we have a bounce in the early universe, we can heuristically understand that as quantum gravity being repulsive in some way. So if quantum gravity is repulsive, can that smooth out homogeneities? Sorry, smooth out inhomogeneities and homogenize the early universe. So that's a hope. Now, if you do a perturbative analysis, this is not at all what happens. If you have a contracting universe, your perturbations will grow. Uh, and what you can calculate is that the amplitude is preserved across the bounce. So, perturbatively, this doesn't happen at all. Okay, what about a non-perturbative analysis? Now, what I'm going to propose is to look at the LTB space-time. So this is spherically symmetric with dust. Bakar gave uh, a talk on this yesterday. Um, and it's spherically symmetric, so you can think of it in the homogeneous limit as being a cosmology. But you can have arbitrary large inhomogeneities in it, in the, in the radial direction. So let's see what happens. Um, I'm going to show a little video. What I really want you to look at is the energy density here. But I also included a component of the ashkar barbero connection because the equation of motion depends only on this. I have a PDE, which I've rewritten in integral form, so we're looking at weak solutions. And this is the quantity which is driving the dynamics. The energy density is just derived from it. So if you see some spikes here, don't worry. It's not that the numerics are failing. It's just that the, deriv the, the spatial derivatives here are becoming large. The dynamics is entirely driven by this. If there's a spike here, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect the dynamics here at all. So I just want to emphasize that. So we have a contracting phase. And as you can see, energy density is growing. And you get some spikes as this is becoming more and more inhomogeneous. Now, you're going to see a dotted line come down at minus pi over 2. That's where the bounce happens locally. And we see that we have some regions that are becoming homogeneous. So we have some small patches. Now this is not, this is not homogeneous everywhere, right? We, have, we still have some very large spikes. But we have some small regions here which have become homogeneous after the bounce that weren't there before at all. And if we have inflation after this, now we can take these patches and really blow them up to cosmological scale. OK. So let me summarize. Um, as I've argued and Pram was also discussing, LQC is sufficiently mature to make contact between theory and cosmological observations. I think we've made a lot of progress in developing connections between the symmetry reduced theory of loop quantum cosmology and full loop quantum gravity in these three different approaches. But still more work remains to be done. So can we further understand the relationship between the two theories and make it more and more concrete? So again, I'm very encouraged by the work that's been done there, but there's more to be done. I want to return to, to the question that I had earlier. Can we get scale invariance directly from quantum gravity without relying on inflation or ekporosis or any of these other models? If we could, that would be really, really nice. And finally, the other point that I raised, how do we handle transmaking modes? Are they there? Or do they have to somehow emerge in some sense uh, in cosmological space times? But the other takeaway message I want you to take is that there are many, many open problems in cosmology. Now, it's not because there's an open problem in cosmology that quantum gravity will have to solve it. Some problems there 
that are unrelated to quantum gravity. But I do think that quantum gravity may turn out to be key in answering at least some of them. So let me conclude just by bringing back those questions I had at the beginning, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Ed, for this beautiful talk. I just wanted to add two clarifications for the audience. I mean, you mentioned the, the, the mass gap result of LIGO, and potentially, therefore, they might be candidates. But I, I, I've been always skeptical about it because there are stars which can currently collapse. And more recently, the Edinburgh group, for example, has done numerical simulations showing that neutron stars could actually collapse in that thing and form black holes. So I, I don't think it is really a problem. It is just some sociological confusion, in my view, uh, that had existed before. So I just don't want people to jump into this uh, area saying that, oh, there's a golden opportunity here that's almost all resolved. And yeah, like, just, just to clarify, that certainly was one group of people who had made that argument and there was no consensus. But Right, right. Yeah. And, and now it has been actually established that there can be uh, black holes in that region. So. And, and the other thing was that there is also very nice work, uh, a very fascinating work by, by Stanford group. It's a collaboration between mathematics and physics people. And they, they just use this, um, uh, the Ricci flows to show that if you just use part of Einstein's equation, then in fact, generically, these home, this, this patches will grow and uh, form you know, very homogeneous decider-like phases, exactly what you were talking about before. Uh, in the very last bit. So and it's quite, quite rigorous and it's, quite, it's also fascinating. So you may want to look at it and other people may want to look at it again also. Yeah, I, I will, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Ed. This was a phenomenal review and outlook. I really enjoyed it. I have uh, a question about something that you mentioned uh, uh, it's clear that uh, there are these two ingredients that appear in all of the story, that is uh, the scale of inflation. You need something that sets a scale five orders of magnitude away from the Planck length. And the second is uh, you need that the number of inflationary foldings is uh, not too small, but not too large either. Something between 60 and 70, but not that far from that. Uh, what is your perspective? What do we need to know? What is missing? Uh, uh, how important are these two numbers? Right, so, so I think there are two perspectives here. One is we have some data and we can try and fit it. And so let's find an inflaton with some parameters such that we have, energy, we have inflation at a certain energy scale and we can choose initial conditions such that we have the right amount. So that's sort of very data driven, right? Observations tell us this, let's follow that. Now, alternatively, you could say, well, can we argue for this from first principles? And it would be nice if you could do that. I think that's still an open problem. Um, certainly from quantum gravity, you, as, as you point out, it's challenging because the energy scale of inflation is orders of magnitude away from the Planck scale. So that doesn't mean it can't be done, but it, there, there's not a natural explanation there. So, so this is why I mean, I think this question for me is, is very important. If, if we can get that without those requirements, that'd be very nice. But in the meantime, it's certainly true that we can take these inflationary models and just say, okay, this is the data we have. Are we able to fit that? And the answer is yes, very well. Thank you. And yes, five is many orders of magnitude, but it's not that many. It's only five. That, that's true. Yes, we are lucky. Yeah. Thank you. With a square, I know. It's 10 to the... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> More questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Edward again. Thank you.